Imagine losing your sister while she was giving birth to her child. And instead of being just a terrible footnote in your life, you decide to use technology to help other women avoid your sister's unfortunate and tragic fate. But there are both systemic and technological challenges you need to overcome to do this. In this episode of State of Performance, you'll hear an interview I did with Mohamed Kamara, the founder of Innov Cares, a company focused on modernizing healthcare for women of color. Mohammed's mission comes from this personal tragedy and a desire to address the high mortality rates among minority women during childbirth. His company addresses implicit biases in healthcare and provides tech solutions like telemedicine to help women of color get access to culturally sensitive doctors. Listen and watch as Mohammed emphasizes the importance of understanding user problems and staying mission-driven in building impactful technology solutions that perform well for both patient and doctor users. Mohammed, welcome. Who are you and what do you do? Sure. Hey, John. Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. Excited to be here and um, having this conversation with you. So who I am, I'm the founder of Innov Cares, where we are modernizing healthcare for women of color. And the premise of the entire company is to ensure that women of color have access to care um, and normalize prenatal and postpartum care support for them. And um, I came to this mission because my sister passed during childbirth. So pretty cool she died in Sierra Leone. We know that 500,000 women die each year from pregnancy-related complications in the, um, in the world. Now, that same number is 800 women that die from pregnancy-related complications in the U.S. And majority of those women are minority women. And so there's something broken in the healthcare system that's causing them to not have access to care. And more and most importantly, there's a lot of bias, implicit bias that, that goes in to the healthcare providers that, 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 that gives them care. Um, so we're addressing some of those implicit bias training as well for the providers. So this, so this woman can have access to care um, that's equitable. So what example of some of these biases have you seen or experienced? So bias training is the, is the fact that we know as human beings, we have a lot of implicit bias that we carry on. And that's sometimes we carry, carry that into our profession too. That includes physicians, right? That includes the nurses, and some of the, the implicit bias that we have is certain e economic statuses. So the black people um, have higher paid tolerance. So when, they, when a woman is, is giving, giving birth, they, they normally, especially black women, they normally don't have prenatal support. These are you, when you first had, when you, when you first had, had a child, did you have a, um, did, they, did they ever talk to you about a birth plan? Uh, no, they did not. Exactly. So that's one, that's the problem. Um, so if you, if I ask the same question to actually, there's a chief operating officer of Stanford health yesterday. And it's like, yeah, we did. We have, we had an entire book birth plan. We had those classes. That's, and, 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 and he's Caucasian, that, that gentleman is Caucasian. That's the difference, right? Where certain population will get those, um, education. They, they will get those classes. As a couple, the the wife and the husband, when they go and go go through their birthing experience, they will be, they will they will have this birth plan that they will have, and that birth plan just explains this is what to expect when you're going through your your first having your first child, um, and when you walk into those hospitals, how to advocate for yourself because sometimes those moms are in pain, right, and they're telling them while they're in pain. Certain procedures should, should work for you, but that shouldn't be the case. So, if a mom, uh, one of our one, one, one of my closest friend um, here, he's actually very recently six, six seven weeks ago, he just gave birth. Um, his wife, his wife just gave birth. But his wife found out that she has preclamation when done the, the, the day of the birth. So her blood pressure was two hundred. That may, so if your blood pressure is 150, 190 or above. Those are the, all the signs that you have preclamation, which is a hypertensive disorder. And this disorder itself um, can lead to child death, right? Um, that's what happened to my sister. Blood pressure was out of whack. 
Um, the nurses, by the time they decided to attend to her, it was already too late for her. She died. The, the child didn't survive either. My aunt died of the same condition in Colombo, so I'm thankful that the child, the child survived. The child is five years old now. So this is, this is the, these are the things that we train our physicians. They go through our implicit bias training and humble care. That, that same level of care that you give to your, to, uh, white, your white counterparts or your, your white patients should be extended to that, that those are minority patients, Black and Latin, right, when they walk into those hospitals so they can have excellent care. So that's part of that's part of that's part of the issue we're solving for. So we so we 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 do we do it uniquely to a to a tech, but the the basis of the basis of the company is really equitable care for everyone. Are you guys kind of like a teledoc for black doctors and patients? I will I will I I I wouldn't say we're a teledoc per se. Where where there's similarities, there's a lot of similarities. But in terms of our uniqueness, we connect patients to culturally competent doctors. So doctors that are are are, are trained in implicit bias training and providing humble care. So there's a there was a particular patient that our very first patients that we got a chance to see. And I'll give you an example here. Well, part of part part is telehealth, so they can do video consults in a HIPAA compliance platform that we have. The second component of our technology is also RX delivery. So when a patient is done seeing a physician, we can, we can we actually mail those medications to the patient's home. So in 50 states, we can mail, mail medications to you. The third piece, the third piece of the technology is uh, is a is a piece that that does remote patient monitoring. So this is where a patient actually takes a 10 second video of himself and he runs through our AI and email cloud and gives back three unique reports and that reports include the patient's health score, the corrected BMI, any predisposed risk they may have. So if they have type 2 diabetes, um, hypertension, um, preclinical, we show those risk factors and then we give when they were given recommendation on how to improve those risk factors as well. The last piece of it is is the gamify wellness piece. So we do we uh, we do peer-to-peer -peer support so patients can add their friends and family. So they'll go on bike rides for example and then we track their steps and then we give them rewards for adopting those health and behavior. So pretty comprehensive platform um, on the patient side, and then and then there's a physician app as well. Um, so we have two um, 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 platform patients and a physician app, and then the web version. So three products. So are those four different platforms? So three different plat three different platforms. So for the web version itself, I mean, we are talking about a PH PHI that we use for the language. Framework is Laravel. Um, um, so for the web version, we use a similar, similar, similar language. Um, um, for the for the for the for the iOS language, we use Swift, right? There's other, and then Android we use Java. But it's it's it's, a, it's the platform itself is on iOS and Android, right? Um, so it's different different um, language that we use um, to develop the, the develop the tech. So going native, was that a decision that you made or was that a team decision? Yeah, so I I I wanted it to be native and the reason is because it's it's faster for us to make changes. Um, um and with with it's faster for us to make changes, it communicates easily to the web app as well, right? Um and literally if we if we didn't if we didn't if we if we if we, if we didn't use native um, native JS, it would take it would take a longer time for us to develop develop um, and push the codes right and those changes. Um, so that was a decision that I I made and the dev the dev team was great. Mm -hmm. What were some of the challenges you faced leading up to launching everything? So when we first built the web version. Um, first mistake we made, the first mistake we made was, so we, we started, I, I knew, so I knew, I told them we were going to use native JS, but then we, we were going to switch to creating a full mobile app and the physician and the provider mobile app. Um, the first mistake we made, we made, we made was on the physician, on the web version, when you 
search for positions, you, you search by different specialties. Um, we did away with that with a new web version where there's already a list of the different providers that you already have as a, as a, as a patient and you can just click there and see the provider right away. So we, there's a, there was like one step we could do away, we do, we did away with one step, um, as opposed to doing a search because the, the search itself, the search for function and functionality was all, was put placed in the, um, web, in the full mobile app. So the white version is, is a way for you to just connect to the physician to check your, your, um, you know, medications, right? Um, it's quicker because we know that in the web version, we don't want you to stay in the web version so, so much. We want you to, it's just traditional people use their mobile phone anyways. The web version is, the web version is more mostly for the physicians, right? They're, they're in their, in their office, they're typing, they're, see, they're looking at an EHR, an EHR system. So we wanted to make sure that it's, it, it's friendly for the physicians. So, it, it, so, so, that, so, so to answer your question very shortly, we think about our user before we build. That's, that, that, that's, what, that's, what, that's what told us what to build. So what were a couple of things you think you guys did right performance-wise or otherwise? So one thing is I was intimately close to the problem. My sister passed. My aunt passed. But they were intimately close to the problem. But beyond me was the fact that I had a chance to travel to the Dominican Republic and were providing care over there to women of affected by the Zika virus. So I got a chance to talk to a lot of physicians, a lot, a lot of um, patients as well. Again, that's part of customer discovery, right? You're discovering what your user truly wants so you can build a product that they can use. Not just what you, you wake up one day as a developer, you dream of this product and it's going to be really cool and you go and code it. That's why sometimes, that's, that's the reason why technologies don't get used because you just dream of it. Instead of going to go talk to your user. So we pause. I did a, the hard work of going to talk to my users. That means in DR, in Cuba, and Costa Rica, right? And then I then went to um, um, DC. In DC, we launched in, a, in three clinics, Dr. Alwood's clinic. And there was a particular user that Dr. Alwood got a chance to see that told us what to build. This user was, she's a 33 year nurse practitioner that lived in Columbus, Ohio, experiencing an infertility issue. And she had her own OB, but the OB wasn't culturally competently trained. So she found us online. Book an appointment, appointment with Dr. Al, they paid $35 out of pocket. And they do they did their first video consult. The time, the time it was a web version, right? And um, and he told a treatment plan for her to try for her infertility a month after she texted us, hey, I'm pregnant. So he walked, right? Um, then out of that, a beautiful baby boy was born alive and well. Um, that was a joy for us. That 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 user, but that user came to the platform as well after the childbirth. She came to say, she said, Hey, I'm experiencing some postpartum depression. It's like, how else can you help us? So we, what we did, we connected her to a clinical psychologist, a, um, um, a health coach and a naturopathic doctor. The, and, um, the health coach was a personal trainer as well. So they, they helped in terms of probably losing the extra pound to get her. So we, we, we connected her to, um, other moms that are gone through her, her similar journey. So they were, they were, they were, they were, they were able to do like bike rides, they would track their steps and then give them what's right up to the self behavior. Again, our user told us what to build. So we built a platform for her, the patient app, for her and the physician app for Dr. Awudi. Then we were expanded to 2,000 patients um, and 15, 15 providers. So we began, we began with one user and one provider. And that's how we built the platform. What specific performance issues did you encounter and had to resolve? Yeah, um, so we, I mean, we use, we use a different tech stack here. Um, when a user is seen, before they see a pay, uh, physician, they go through their payment schedule, their payment process, right? So that one is very seamless. They will they were, they were sort through the different physicians um, by specialty, and then they will book an appointment via video and in half. But before they book their appointments, they'll pay as well. They'll pay with their credit card. Um, we, we're going to have an insurance option too. And then they will see the they will see the physician via video or in app message. Um, this the physician though some of the issue that we probably encounter on the physician side is around where, whether or not we should we add in those modules, those modules, those video modules that teach the physicians how to be culturally competent. Those visual video those video modules slow down performance. Um, <laughs> they do. The video, those video models take up more space, 
more um, gigabytes, right? So that slows down performance. And, and for us, we have to creatively think of ways for us to add those videos without slowing down the, the physician app, the performance of the physician app. So the more videos we add that that, that, that contain all these different topics about whether it's be culturally competent and trend and the implicit bias, the the more risk that we were wanting to in terms of how fast the app performs. So are those videos going down to the physician app's device itself? Correct. Yeah. So that's 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 part of the app performance issue that we know we will encounter that and we need to find a way to address that before it becomes a little too um, burdensome um, for our physicians. Now, the other the part of the technology as well, it, this has to in easily integrate to existing EHR systems. When I use the word EHR means electronic health records. Um, and part of that integration piece is what does, Ep if a physician is using Epi, can they see this? Can they can we sync their scheduling into ours as well, right? So those their scheduling, I mean our scheduling platform are, are saying the same thing, right? Um, the gap, the gap, the, the the gap in the window where a physician they say in this four hours I'm gonna see patients via telehealth, and then the rest of the the the, the, the time period I'm gonna be doing more in person patient visits, right? So syncing those calendars, that's one, right? We we have to make in the HR integration we use the B docs to sync those calendar. The second component as well is the messaging piece, make sure that, that they can actually, if, they, if they've seen, the, seen their patients, the same messaging investment they get through the app, they're also seen on the on their AHR. Um, so that, that's the AHR integration piece. So, well, well, when you start a, when you start and create an app, as a developer, you'll think through all of that, how it goes and work for the, for the provider workflow. How have you integrated with EHR systems like Epic to make sure that user experiences aren't terribly impacted? Yeah, so we use Redox as our integration partner. So they help with that part of that integration piece. Um, and partly as well, it's understanding how each physician will utilize it in their workflow. Because with Epic, when you go, we, I, I did an um, Epic Go Live, right? When you, with Epic Go Live in a hospital, you got to teach those physicians. And part of the reason why Epic exists or the, uh, this AHR systems exist is to ensure that those physicians can, can record, record um, patients, patients um, visits and they get billed bill for that and they get paid, right? But then that becomes burdensome for the physician because after, after, after those eight hours of seeing patients, they may have seen 30, 20 to 30 patients and then they have to come home and as well do their paperwork, which, which is which is which plays into the physician burnout, right? And then of course chemistry with um with um with the significant order. So I'm sure you've experienced that. Um, <laughs> so it's it's the it's it's like how can we come into that workflow and not, not add extra tasks for them? That's that's the way we look at it, right? Um, because so we don't want to add any 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 problem to like that physician burnout rate. It's already too high. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned AI machine learning, and I saw on the website something about patented NASA technology. So can you explain what that is, how you guys use it, and how it all fits in, knowing how it might affect performance? Yeah, so so the that tool itself is a remote patient monitoring tool. So we call in the in um in the healthcare RPM. Those remote patient monitoring tool allows for the user to know exactly the different health risks may be experiencing and then how to improve. Um, for us, we utilize that the piece the pattern that piece is the correct is the corrected BMI. Yeah, the corrected BMI. So actually, uh, so the of BMI is not a true measurement of your metabolic health. Um, when you go see your physician, that they they're, as a black man, oftentimes with muscles, or even even if you're obese, right? Your BMI they said you're obese, and and by the way, if you took a step back, even physician, uh, even Caucasian. So I had a we had an advisor that's an active runner. He's a Caucasian um, um, gentleman, and he went to see his physician and told him that he's obese. 
true. Um, based on based on the traditional BMI. So the corrected BMI accounts for the true measurements of your, your, your true metabolic health. So that's one piece that that's the piece that's patented. And then and then we aggregate those data and they give you back three unique reports that includes all the different risk factors that you may be, be, be risk exposed to. And then that and then a total disease risk score. How this disease risk score tells you what to do? We we'll give you we we'll give you some things to do so you can actually reduce that disease risk score and improve your health as you um as you adopt healthy behaviors, right? And then that goes with you as well as you age too. So we aggregate that data. If you're 30 years old, those are the things you're supposed to do at the, at age at age 30, right? So that's around where we're personalizing medicine, as opposed to the cook, the way healthcare is currently is like just a cookie cookie cook, 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 cutter system. We, we are very well, our technology is very highly personalized. So the, the, the AI, the AI, the AI and ML is more of an is around the aggregating those data and then speeding back um um, um uh, uh, three unique reports and by the way when you when you take that video because it's a video that you take and that video itself created three three dimension of your body your entire full body a three dimension of your full body right and then speed back and then and then that then goes to our ml clouds run through the, the algorithm and then speed back those three unique reports yeah so does some of that live in part of this ML cloud? Yeah, so, so some of our some of them stays that some of our, that we um it, it stays in our um because we, we can't it with hip being hyper compliance, um there's certain things you, you you can keep on your server because of hyper compliance. So the actually at uh, the three dimension of the body, once most it's processed, it's deleted, and then the, the reports, then you have the reports as a patient. Um for but so that we can follow HIPAA compliance and high tech compliance. Now, is that processing happening on the device every time? <laughs> it changes. Yep. Yep. It processes every single time you're, you're, you're opening so, so one of those new reports. How's that happening? What, what are the adverse effects of doing something like that? And that's where the, the machine learning and the AI comes into place, right? To help with that processing faster. <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> yep. With all this processing, do you guys have a monitoring tool or an SDK in your apps that's making sure you're aware of what's happening and what's performing well? Yeah, we do. What are some of the tools that you guys use? Yeah, we. I mean, we 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 use a sort of MSDK. We use Firebase. Um, um, there, there. We use um, we use Firebase for our push notifications. Um, for our chat. Um, and I know, I know, I I, I know. We use um, um, uh, uh, a a different a di um um. We've gone between quick blocks and um, all the for for the video calls. So th there's different different um, tech stack that we use, um, the different tools that we use um, 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 for like for the video call and library library as well. Um, for in, for in terms of our instance mixtures that things run very faster, we use EC, the EC2 level um, AWS. Yep. Yep. Are you guys using Firebase Performance Monitor or Crashalytics natively, or are you sending that data back to something like AWS CloudWatch? Yeah, we do. What's something you think should perform well, but usually leads to user complaints of slowness? It's the, it's the reports. It's all the different different types of reports right there on, and those reports are standardized. And that's part of the issue. Uh, so with with with, with when we when we think about EHO system, every single EHO system has different unique reports based on based on different um, um, provider specialty, right? And and some may have those similar reports but different, right? And each position will get confused, like why I want this report so I can actually write my patient's notes and bill. Well, then I, um, I, I, then I then I go use a different system like a sonar. Then they, they, then it's not the same standardized report. 
and that creates frustration for the physicians because they're going from one one system that has different different different, different types of reports and they have to learn all the different reports again. Um, so that's a, that's one of the frustration. Like, okay, I'm tired of technology. It's taking too much of my time. It keeps me away from my patients patient care. Um, and so I, I understand their pain. And part of what we did with we actually created the technology, I was seeing 20, 20 to 30 patients within those physicians and I was rotating in different, between different specialty. So I knew intimately how the physician would interact with that technology and the existing EHR system. Again, I didn't I did, I did do it different. I, talk, I went and talked to our users as opposed to um, let me build and assume that this is how our physicians will utilize the technology. I went and see, I actually see patients with those physicians. And how they were, and how they were actually interacting with um, all of the existing DHL systems. Now, telehealth took off during the pandemic. Any thoughts as to why it's, it has taken this long for that to happen? That's a whole different conversation. <laughs> health, healthcare, healthcare, healthcare is like a child. They move very slow. Um, they're learning to. They're learning to crawl and hopefully they will learn to walk quick as well, but they move very slow. Everybody else has known things and they, win. They, they, they take their time to catch up. How were you guys affected by the increase in patients and doctors during the pandemic? Were your systems overstressed with the flood of users? So uh, all of the above, um, <laughs> well, what? Well, the the thing that makes it made it better, unfortunately, it took. This is so unfortunate that it took a, a tragic events like the pandemic to realize that they use all the technology and the importance of it. Now, when I when we go to talk to physicians and we talk to our health systems, we don't have to convince them anymore. Um, it's 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 it, it's it's more so okay. We know that the technology can be used; it can create impact for patients. But how and what's the engagement like? Um, so that's the conversation that we have. What is the patient engagement? And that's the reason why we use like a different rewards system and then the remote patient monitoring to ensure that those patients are engaging with those with the product beyond just um, a telehealth visit. It's a um, lifestyle change and behavior change with those patients. Because um, that's what really truly matters after they leave those four walls of those hospitals and those clinics. What do, what do the patients do afterwards after you tell them this is a treatment plan for you, go, for, for you to go try, do them at home? That's what really tells the, 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 the um, true, true health of that patient. So we focus on that. Um, that's the changes. So before we can tell the health became sexy, we were doing it. Um, <laughs> everybody else started doing it in 2020 when it became sexy. Um, so we're, we're still, we're, we're still, we're still around, but we're focusing now, we're focused on our session one, the engagement, not just the telehealth. The telehealth is like old news. The engagement is what, what's, what, what's the, that's the next, next sexy thing. And then of course, the, um, the next sexy thing will probably be something else, but we're more patient monitoring. And then, um, the patient engagement is much more important than just the telehealth basics. Did you ever reach a point where you wanted to give up with the app or the business? If not, what helped you push forward? So I'm a, I'm a mission driven person, but the journey hasn't been easy, right? I'm, I'm a, and the company itself, we're a mission driven company and our focus is really serving patients and serving physicians and other providers, right? And with that thoughts in mind, knowing that I'm so intimately close to the problem, that keeps me going. Um, and knowing that the statistics that are staggering in the U.S., it costs a health system 190k if a, if a if a child is born before 28 weeks. That's 190,000. Traditionally, it's three k's for you to go to give give birth. It's 3,000 that you pay. But before 28 weeks, that's 190k. So knowing those stats intimately um, forced me to be positioned to say, okay, there's a big problem here that we need to solve for health systems and as well as for individual patients. Because 800 women are still dying of pregnancy com related complications. That's 500,000 women every single year internationally. That keeps me focused. That keeps the company focused because we're single. That mission is what drives us ultimately. But one of the one of the things that comes into building the tech as a second world founder and now as well, let's say as a minority founder, 
Of course, you go to the micro question because people will question your ability to execute. Um, building this technology, I actually built a, I, um, it's all, it was, it was self-funded by me, right? Until, yeah, self-funded by me until May is when I actually took out, I, I took outside invest, investment from just Jumpstart Foundry. So we got, we got, we got, we got some um, capital from Jumpstart Foundry, right? Um, so now, now, now the, 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 the company is venture backed as well. So, but before, 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 before May, it was, um, it was nearly myself, um, front of the company, um, because I believe, I believe in the mission and I believe that we can actually create an impact for minority women. What advice do you have for anyone else who's looking to do what you've done? Making sure that they're able to create fast performing apps for their users and customers. Um, fall in love with your user's problem and be intimately close to that. Then you'll know exactly what to build. The technology is gonna technology evolves and changes, right? Um, the code the code involves and change, but the user will tell you what they what to build, what they will pay for. You want a, you want an, you want a business, right? You want a mission driven business. And part of that is you need to know exactly what your users' problems are, solve for that, not go really build something that's sexy and they never use it. Uh, build or build and build and then you think you think they will come, but then they will not come. So part of building is also, hey, I'm gonna go talk to my user, read, be close to them, build and then market it to the to, to more users, right? And um so that's that's what we do. We for me, through this process is I fell in love with the problem. I went and talked to the users. I didn't build anything yet. Went and talked to the users. Then they tell me what to build, both the patients and the, and the physicians. They tell me what to build. Um, then I went and I went and built. And I came back to them and said, "Hey, wait, can you give me some feedback?" Um, I said, and, and so that's part of the cost, um, customer discovery. So I believe in. I believe no matter how much you grow with your company, you still talk to your users because they will tell you exactly what 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 next functionality to build. Uh, what what next stack next product else will release? They'll tell you that. As opposed to you saying here in your boardroom after you've gotten all this funding, what else will I build? And coming up with so solutions that they're there will fall upon your face, and it's not it doesn't resonate with the users. Thank you for your time. Anything else you'd like to add? No, no. So thank you for thank you for having me on. Um, I hope this was hopefully insightful for those that are listening. Um, Again, build, do not build until you know exactly what problem you're, build, you're building for. So go, leave the technology alone, go talk to your users first, and then go build. Um, if anything else from this conversation you take away, well, as a founder, fall in love with your, with your, with your, with your, with your, um, use, you with your users problem, and then build from there. Is there a way people can get in touch with you if they want? Sure. So we are on LinkedIn. We are on IG. So follow us at I N O V C A R E S. Um, and also you can reach out directly to myself. Um, my email is M Kamar K A M E R A I N of cares.com. That's I N O V C A R E S. I'm sure you probably, John, you include that. Um, and then there's also our, our, our direct contact, contact us, I N of cares.com as well, um, that you can reach out to. So, we are we are on any social media platform, just I N O V I N O V C A R E S, and then um of course the mobile mobile apps on iOS and Android. So check us out, in of case patients and in of case providers. Well, Mohammed, thank you again for taking the time. Thanks. Well, that's it. I want to thank Mohammed again for joining me on this episode of State of Performance, and thank you for joining me as well. I'll catch you on the next one. Deuces.